Good evening, ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests. And thank you very much for joining us again for our second Tuesday session. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. And I hope if you can't hear me, somebody will let me know that you can't hear me. Um, so we're back this week. We are still running our campaign, our Mr. Wong's Lullaby campaign. And as part of that, we're running Tuesday sessions every Tuesday with some brilliant guests and some brilliant musicians as well. Um, so my first guest this evening is our patron. Um, our patron is, and I've really struggled with um, this pronunciation, Emeritus Professor Steve Hawley. I believe that's the correct pronunciation, but no doubt someone will um, pick me up on that. Um, so Steve is a Sheffield-based artist and filmmaker. Um, he's been working with film and video since the 1980s, and his work has been shown at video festivals and broadcast worldwide since then. His original preoccupation was with language and image, and in 1995, his experimental documentary made with Tony Steger, again, probably pronouncing that wrong, <laughs> on artificial languages was broadcast on Channel 4 TV. Most recently, his work has looked at new forms of narrative. In such works as Love Under Mercury, his first film for the cinema, which won a prize at the Ann Arbor Film Festival and Amen ICA Cinema in 2002, a palindromic video which won the prize for most original video at the Vancouver Video Poem Festival. He has explored issues around the impact of new technologies on narrative. Yarn 2011 uses the DVD medium to create a never ending story. And Actor 2013 makes film without a camera by putting the performer in a motion capture suit. Manchester Time Machine, made with the Northwest Film Archive, is the first ever iPhone app to combine archive film footage and GPS and is part of a project looking at the nature of the city including Not to Scale 2009, filmed in a series of model towns. His work with the archive has also included War Memorial 2017, which was nominated for Best Short Documentary at the Sheffield Doc Fest, and Mancunia with poet Michael Simmons Roberts, premiered at Home Manchester. Uh, he is... Emeritus, oh God, this word is going to kill me, um, Emeritus Professor at the Manchester School of Art and Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, and we are delighted to have Steve as our patron. Steve has very benevolently and kindly described Mr Wong's Lullaby as a quirky and moving film that wears itself lightly. It's a film about remembrance and reconciliation. So I will bring Steve on screen now. Hello, Steve. How are you doing? Hi, Claire. You're spot on, by the way, with your pronunciation. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Emeritus professor is... Actually, yeah. All that means is that I used to be a professor, but they don't pay me anymore. So, oh, uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> not as glamorous as it sounds then. No, no. <laughs> no. Oh, well, it's not a word I get to say very often, so I'm glad I got it right in the one time that I did say it. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm delighted to be here. I'm glad to be able to support uh, Mr. Wong's lullaby, the lullaby, any way I can. I think it's uh, it's. Uh, I mean, I've, I've worked all my life as a filmmaker and an artist, and I think it's uh, a great thing that you're doing, really. Especially having met Annie. I mean, she's somebody like my age or a bit younger, and uh, spent her. Uh, entire career, I think, as a social worker, and has now turned has now turned to writing. So it's a fantastic thing to support. I think. Oh, thank you. Well, we're we're delighted to have you, Steve. Um, yeah, Annie, like you said, she has had a rather varied career, and writing is a new. Well, I think she's been writing for a long time, but going into it almost full time uh, is a new thing for her. Um, would you tell us a little bit about your journey into the world of? the creative arts because I know you've had a less than conventional route yourself yeah I uh, well I went to art school but um, that was my uh, um, proper journey but before that I I was um, I had nothing to do with the arts I haven't got art O level or GCC or anything and um, I was working in an insurance company in Leeds and eating my sandwiches in at the lunchtime in Leeds City Art Gallery thinking 
uh, looking at some contemporary artworks and thinking, well, this looks really interesting. And uh, and then also the, the the Leeds City Art Gallery Library. I was reading about art schools and things. And basically, uh, I thought I'd really love to go to art school. I had no idea that I wanted to make art. I think I just wanted to uh, pose around with a portfolio and pretend I was a, uh, an artist. Um, so, uh, but yeah, my first career was uh, in uh, insurance, in motor insurance, and I got all the exams. So I'm actually a, an associate of the Chartered Insurance Institute. And if you ever have a bang with your car, I'm, I'm your guy, basically. Brilliant. <laughs> so, but so, so after seven years, I went to, uh, um, I went to art school. And um, the thing about going to art school, it sort of ruins you forever, really. You, it, it renders you unfit for uh, 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 having, a, having a normal job. So at the age of 21, I had a, um, a company mortgage, prudential mortgage, and I had a, a car and, uh, and a marriage. And by the time I was 30, I, I had none of those things, and I was living in a bed sit. But I, yeah. did, have, but I did have a fine art degree. So. Useful also. <laughs> uh, yeah, having spent my life teaching in art schools, it, it's yeah, it's um, the experience is incredibly useful. The experience changes your perspective, it changes your world, and and it did with me. Um, and I was very, uh, I could, could say, lucky that I, I went to art school at the time. It was 1979. Um, it was just at the start of uh, video art in this country. Well, a little bit after the start. So, although the equipment that you needed to make uh, films and videos, well, videos, was very expensive, incredibly bulky, we used a thing called a Sony Rover Porter Pack, which was a record, a reel-to-reel -reel recorder, which is like a suitcase around your neck, and a separate camera. And so, it was only art schools and some institutions that could afford these. Um, and uh, whereas now, of course, anybody, you know, everybody watching with their phone can can make much better films, videos than we than we could with those. But the difference is that, of course, um, the you could say the competition is much greater now. You know, you people with with YouTube and uh, Vimeo and whereas in those days, I think there must have been 20, maybe 25 people in this country who were working with uh, creative uh, video as a creative art medium. So uh, I'd say I was a bit lucky really in that um, I was part of that, you know, just after the first phase and was able to show my work and, and make my career in that, in that field. Wow, timing is everything, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> timing and hard work and talent. <laughs> well, possibly. I mean, um, the other thing I would say is that the, uh, most of my, uh, well, no, nearly, nearly all of my career, I've I've had another job, which has been in in academia. So I um, uh, I like work, I like being in art schools. So I started teaching in art schools, and then became you know, work, work um, going up the greasy pole of management. So I was um, so I ended up as a head of departments, and then uh, uh, head of associate dean for research. So that's that's what paid the bills. But um, at the same time, I kept my film, you know, my filmmaking going and uh, showing uh, showing work. But if I had to have made, if I had to eat from the uh, films that I made, I would have been starving. I have to yeah. say, so, um, <laughs> living on beans and pasta. Uh, if I was lucky, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. It's not all glamour, kids. Be warned. <laughs> um, but the other thing I would say about that is that uh, no, it isn't. It isn't glamour. But as opposed to, I mean, I I, I did have some offers to work in uh, in the uh, television industry, and I've uh, collaborated a lot with my uh, uh, longtime friend and colleague Tony Steiger, who is a um, producer and a, a, a documentary director. And um, but that world doesn't appeal to me really because. Um, the one thing about making work where you don't have to earn a living at it is that you can do exactly what you want. Uh, there's nobody breathing down your neck. There's no commissioning editor saying, oh, you ought to change this or do this and that. You can do exactly what you want. 
Um, but of course the downside, and that's great because I feel that like I'm expressing exactly what I want to do, uh, what I want to uh, create. Um, and I usually, well, I always get them shown somewhere, the, the films, you know, in festivals and sometimes broadcast. But uh, the, uh, yes, but um, um, without those, yeah, limitations of having to work within within a within a broadcast industry, which is all, and that's that's what's interested me. Using video as a, a creative medium, as an art form, uh, and uh, yeah, so I'm I'm happy with what I've done. That's good news. <laughs> Um, and you mentioned that you've had your work in festivals there and you've also been a festival judge yourself. Um, how did that come about? And I'm sure this would be of interest to, well, to most people, but particularly to anyone in the world of film. What, what was the experience like of being on the other side of the table, if you like, not being the person sending in, but rather the person looking at what's coming through the door? It was absolutely riveting. The festival was the uh, Clermont Ferrand uh, short film festival in uh, in uh, central France, which is widely regarded as the best short film festival in the world. It's very difficult to get in. Uh, in fact, I'd, I'd applied to get in myself. I'd been rejected from the festival. Um, <laughs> <The> irony. <laughs> rather so, um, and the reason I got in was because I made a film with Tony about... Uh, I've, as you said, thank you for that introduction. I've had a long uh, um, history of dealing with issues to do with language in my work. And I made a documentary, which was funded by Channel 4 and the Arts Council, with Tony about artificial languages, things like Esperanto. Um, but they've actually, it was, it was kind of about English eccentricity, but also about the peculiarities of people who invent their own languages, for example. Well, somebody, this was done 25 years ago, some, uh, a French, somebody who was a, um, a creative director at this festival had seen it, included it in the festival, and then asked me to be a judge of the international competition, which is the most important competition. A lot of the films that are submitted for that uh, competition uh, get nominated for the short film Oscar, for example. Um, it's ironic because I don't make short fiction myself. So I did feel a bit of an interloper, but I was having too good a time <clears throat> in the five star hotels. And uh, plus I, lo I, um, I love watching films, you know, it's, it's something I do for fun. And um, we were ensconced in a, a cinema, you know, all day long uh, watching these short films, having our own row of seats re reserved for us. It was. It was very, very interesting. What there were a couple of things that were interesting. One is that the astonishingly high standard of filmmaking. I mean, uh, you know, it, only one in a hundred films is selected for this festival, and uh, there are a hundred films in the competition. So you, you know, you, you're the best of ten thousand films uh, in order to to win it. The other is that. Um, the, the 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 English the British films that were selected I thought were quite interesting. They showed a sort of Ken Loach kind of view of of Britain. Um, they were quite often northern. They're set in Manchester or Liverpool. Uh, they were quite often quite dystopian, quite downbeat. One of the films was set in Bootle and was a dramatized version of the Jamie Bulger case. Uh, a lot of the films were very. I mean, that was possibly the most harrowing experience I've had in the cinema. But a lot of, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the films were, there weren't a lot of laughs, put it that way. Um, <laughs> so um, it seemed to me that um, uh, light romantic comedies were not the way to get your film shown in this particular international arena. But um, the, the quality was, was fantastic. They were incredibly international. They were from all over the world. And uh, it was one of the best experiences that I have uh, I've had have had i don't know why they put me on the international fiction jury claire denis who's a, is a famous french film director was uh, was the star of the, ex, the the festival and she was on the experimental uh, film jury so um anyway <laughs> maybe there was a miscommunication somewhere. Well, maybe I, I didn't feel i could go out to her and say can we swap claire but anyway <laughs> yeah. so um i just uh, but it was a no it was a 
it was a wonderful experience and uh i uh yeah it, it gave me a real overview as it were a snapshot of what young filmmakers were making uh that uh, it was a couple of years ago now in that in 2019 so great um wow that sounds really interesting um we have a question actually from someone uh she is Eleni Haji Daniel and she says hello from a 2004 MMU graduate. Oh, fantastic. Uh, and Eleni asks, aside from equipment and technology, what would you say is the main difference in producing an independent film today compared to maybe the 80s and 90s? Do you think there was more support or more public interest? What would you think has changed or would you have any thoughts on that? Well, the technology Ha, uh, well, it is about technology and distribution, I would suggest. The things that were special then um, uh, were, were to do with having your own voice, to having your own point of view um, within film or video. Nowadays, the, the term is kind of interchangeable. In those days, there were very different things. You could make a film which was very expensive. It involved strips of celluloid um it was shown in cinemas or you can make videos which were shown in art galleries which is the route i took and um which was relatively cheaper but to go back to the question uh i think it is about technology and distribution nowadays the technology is available in everybody's smartphones the distribution networks are at a, a click of the mouse you can you know you can get your film on uh uh, on, on the internet, as I say, through Vimeo or uh, YouTube or whatever format you like. But there is much, much more competition. There are lots and lots of really interesting filmmakers out there. Having said that, I mean, um, uh, uh, not necessarily to focus on your own film, but there is a, it's also much, much easier to apply to film festivals, for example, through sites such as Film Freeway. So um, of the, how many festivals are there out there? I don't know how many there are out there, maybe a 1, thousand, 1200, something like that. So you can create a package, you can put it online, you can submit your film, you do, you, you have to pay a little bit of money, um, um, you know, 20 pounds or so to, to do that. But it's, it's quite an easy way to, to, to get your work distributed. It was, it was a lot harder uh, in the past and those when I started making films I mean we were uh, videos rather we were just showing them to each other really there was a there was a, um, a gallery in in central London called, called the air gallery and we used to go to the air gallery basement and there would be you know 10 people and we would all be artists so and that's completely different now you go to uh, oh I don't know Tate Modern or um, one of those big galleries in there, and uh, there is a huge uh, audience for for video art work, which is which is great. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. That's that's really interesting. Um, something that we spoke about, Steve, um, which I find fascinating, is your current project, which is um, calling Blighty. Um, and that sort of pertains to the theme of Mr. Wong's lullaby purely in the sense that our um, one of our protagonists is an elderly gentleman who was a prisoner of war and um, yeah, you're making well you're working on this project which which deals with something fascinating which is these letters well these um, video letters that were sent from the Far East between 1944 and 1946 back home um, to be essentially shown as little mini films for um, for parents, family members, lovers who were left behind. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about this and where it's going. Yeah, that's a really interesting correspondence because your protagonist Horace is a, he's 99 and he's been. Uh, you know, he's a, he's an ex-Japanese prisoner of war. Uh, and uh, it's not said in the script, but I do wonder, um, a lot of Japanese prisoner of wars, uh, prisoners of war came from the fall of Singapore in 1942, so 43. So um, it's possible uh, in my mind that he, he was taken prisoner then. But at the same, 
at the same time fighting the Japanese in Burma was the 14th Army. And because of the huge distances involved, the fact that they couldn't get, the men couldn't get home leave, um, letters took a long time. They didn't have naffy clubs, uh, uh, entertainment clubs, or uh, you know, even bottles of beer. The British Army decided to create these video letters, you could call them, um, and they filmed eight around eight thousand men. Uh, so there were four hundred films. They were very regional, so. Um, I've traced seven films, for example, that were made in Sheffield. Um, and what I've done with my collaborator, Marion Hewitt from the Northwest Film Archive, is to recreate these, to trace the relatives, as you said, and to recreate the screenings. So um, put all the films online so the relatives can have a look and say, oh, is this my great granddad or my granddad or indeed my father? Or in two cases, we have found the men still alive, brought them to a screening in Manchester and introduced them uh, to each other. So, um, so I trace, you know, trace the people, use uh, mass media, the radio, television, Radio 4 and so on, and then get all the people that we have traced and show the films as they would have been shown in 1944, 45, 46. So in Sheffield, they would have been shown at the Regent Cinema House, which is in Barker's Pool in the centre of the city. And we showed them in the showroom, but we had a sellout, you know, sellout, it was free, but uh, we had packed cinema. <laughs> and um, these, we know from the original screenings that they were very emotional uh, occasions, a mixture of laughter and tears. This, we're talking about a time when Skype didn't exist, video phones didn't exist. If you went to the cinema, it was to see Gone with the Wind or The Grapes of Wrath, you, you know, or to, or to see film stars. You didn't expect to see yourself on the screen or, or certainly not your husband or sweetheart. So, um, the, uh, and the films are really good quality. They're 35 millimeter film with really good sound made in a studio that's mocked up to look like a naffy canteen. Um, so we re recreated these screenings. We've done four of them now, including the Sheffield one and Manchester and uh, Birkenhead and Brighton. And uh, they're very emotional occasions. People come along to honor and remember their uh, relatives. And um, there's not a dry eye in the house, I can tell you. It's a very, really, really satisfying project to be involved with and that has led to the book that i'm just finishing which is called men war and film which is about these calling uh, calling blighty films blighty obviously was it comes it comes from an indian word vilaiti which means foreign so it, it means britain really it means home it means home oh. so yeah fascinating project and uh, well it's for me and um uh, an interesting correspondence with Mr. Mark Wong's uh, lullaby, although you don't really say whether Mr. Wong served in Burma or not, but I, I like to think he did. But uh, sorry, yeah, you, uh, Horace. Horace, Horace yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's that's fascinating. No, I can imagine. I mean, it must be a very emotional time for people because um, there's just so little uh, tangible material that people can get a hold of. Um, so these are the first ever films made. Um, of men speaking informally without script uh, anywhere in the world. If you think about it, the, the um, sound, sound films really didn't start probably until the 1960s, but we're talking 20 years before that. So, and for many people, it was the first time they had seen uh, a, a grandfather or a father. Sometimes they had died in, in action, for example. So they'd still sent the film back and shown it. Um, so uh, there is something, there's an incredible confrontation uh, of looking into the eyes of someone and looking back over 75 or 80 years. Again, a sort of correspondence with your, your own film, I think, because that's one of the things I saw in it, this notion of remembrance and how we think about that particular war with the Japanese, for example. And, 
it, they were called a forgotten army because it was mostly a litany of failure and uh, 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 so and there are very few films about the, the war in Burma so I think uh, yeah it's just I think it for me it adds a kind of deep backstory to what you're trying to uh, talk about yeah wow and I think I suppose as well something we absolutely take for granted now and particularly this year is that we've maybe not been able to see people but we've had access to Skype and Zoom, the dreaded Zoom and all sorts of other means of communication and I suppose what you might not even um, be able to contemplate is that if someone went away you might not hear from them, you might not see them for a long time or ever. You you didn't, I mean one of the men one of the Manchester men says on film, I suppose I'd better say a few words now. The last time I spoke to you was six years ago. That wasn't unusual. You wouldn't see, you would get their letters. Uh, you'd get them late because even the air, air mail letters took a couple of months to, to, to come. Um, and you could send, you could send parcels uh, when they were in India, obviously with their own, when they were actually on active service in Burma, they, it was difficult, but no, you wouldn't see them. You wouldn't see them. They had some other schemes that the men would make gramophone records and, and send them back so you could possibly hear their voice. Uh, and there were radio programs with uh, Vera Lynn, for example, had a radio program where she would interview people. But no, you wouldn't see them. So um, it's a remarkable confrontation, especially now, you know, uh, you're looking back, you're looking back, you are. Um, Jeanette Winterson said something about uh, her book in her memoir of her own life. Um, she said about her own father, said, you can talk with the dead. And that's what I feel when I look at these uh, films, you know, the notion of talking, talking with the dead. So quite a profound experience. Wow, that's fantastic. Brilliant. Well, um, that is Calling Blighty. Um, and the book is imminently emerging it will be out in 2022 uh, that's what the it's it's published by intellect but uh, don't all rush to buy it it's it's an academic book well it's a it's supposedly a popular academic book i i am um, i said this to somebody <laughs> once and he said well how do you know it's going to be popular I said, well, <laughs> it isn't it's probably not going to be popular but i'm writing in a popular way about uh, these uh, these films um so but yes that's uh, that's going to be out next year yeah great well um i mean i've got your um your website up there as well so if anyone's keen to find out a bit more about it um you've got a lot of information up there as well as many other things including lots of um your films are available to view up there as well sure. yeah. uh something else that, um we were going to speak about steve is your interest and relationship with language and i told you that Obviously, my background is a slightly unusual one in that I've come into film via language. So I studied applied languages in Limerick yeah. um, and linguistics and then sort of segued smoothly or not so smoothly into filmmaking. Um, but language is something I've always loved. And um, something that you mentioned, which I thought was quite interesting, was your, your marriage to your wife, Nina, um, and, and how... <laughs> how language and culture have been um you know an interesting but integral part of that relationship that's that's right i have to say that my art work videos were were i was i was focusing on language within these uh, um doing different things I, I made one where i invented my own language and i made another film using uh, the P the ladybird books peter and jane books but made a kind of story out of them now, as it happens, I've been uh, with uh, married to, and um, well, 38 years uh, uh, this year, to Nina is from Slovenia. And so I've learned her language, uh, which I think, they say the world's most difficult language is Korean. Um, I think, uh, you might know more about this than I do, Sarah, but uh, I think Slovene is uh, possibly a rival to that. It's an... The Slovene grammar is impossibly fiendish. Um, in fact, well, every uh, 
just as an example, every noun has got one of 54 different word endings, for example. There are so many word endings, Slovenes themselves can't remember them sometimes. Um, but so, but part of my path to integrating into the country, because we've got a house there and I spend a lot of time there. And in fact, I'm, I've made films there and I'm working on a new film, a sort of Brexit film. <laughs> don't, don't, don't all fall asleep. Um, uh, which is going to look at my relationship with Slovenia and with the language, the impossible, my war against this language, which has been going on for decades. So, yeah, that's, um, so not only is are there, uh, I mean, anybody that uh, has a partner who who comes from a different culture, and Nina is partly Serb as well, partly Serb, partly Slovene, which is another little dash into the cultural mix, uh, we'll, we'll find it, you know, I still, we still both find it challenging every single day. Something will happen that is a kind of cultural uh, misunderstanding, if you like. Um, and then there's a language uh, um, is issue as well. So that's, a, that's an interesting uh, kind of correspondence really. I was working on language anyway, and then I don't speak any other, well, bits and pieces of other languages. I only really learned this to, you know, to talk to my in-laws and integrate. So did they speak English or or is this, did you sort of have a, a lot of um, misinterpreted sign language and body language going on until you took the plunge? Um, um, her, her dad, her, my father-in-law speaks English. My mother-in-law didn't, and um, yeah. So there was there. Ha there are misunderstandings. Every that's the thing that you you um, uh, that is people don't tell you about. There are still misunderstandings every single day when I'm over there. I say a stupid thing, or I realise <laughs> I've been saying something for thirty-five years and it turns out to be wrong or something. You know. <laughs> no one was <laughs> impolite enough to correct you. <laughs> Quite. Um, but what is the what is the alternative? You know, very few British people learn this language, and uh, I didn't want to be one of them. I know. <laughs> it's it's a blessing and a curse being um, a native English speaker because I suppose you have the luxury of not necessarily needing to learn another language. But then I I do think learning another language because of the cultural implications it by, by its very nature broadens your mind because it, when you learn a language you can't but pick up a bit of the culture and and some different sort of ways and nuance nuanced ways of looking at the world as well that's right there's a there's a there's a theory that um, the language actually determines the way we uh, think or, or or the other way around the, the program that I made with uh, Tony Steiger, uh, which was called Language Lessons, which is about artificial languages, was quite interesting. Why would people in England, which is de facto the world language, learn international languages? Uh, Esperanto, Interlingua, Volapük, that's a real language, by the way. It's one of the oldest. Um, well, it's it's strange. They all they they were saying things like, "Well, we 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 feel that we want a neutral language that was going to create world peace if we could all speak it." But at the same time, they all seem to hate each other's guts. So, uh, and there was a lot of rivalry between different. The interlinguists hated the Esperantists and vice versa, and they all hated this um, language called Glossa, which was only spoken by two people, Ron and Wendy Ashby. So anyway, I'm digressing a bit, but uh, there are, I mean, yes, it, it is even more uh, strange, I think, that the artificial language movement has such a toehold in the, in the UK. But um, good luck to them, I yeah, say. I mean, yeah, <laughs> whatever floats your boat. And in these brexit -y times, you know, <laughs> it might come in useful. Um, great. So, um Something else that you mentioned to me, Steve, and I'm not going to ask you to get a guitar out, but you do as well as um, your filmmaking and your uh, other forays. You you also have a musical interest. Uh, yeah, I've got a few things um, that I'm doing. There's the book. Uh, there's the film. The well, actually, I've, I've finished uh, another Brexit film, which is called Broken English. 
good title, eh? Mm. Um, we, but I'm just uh, uh, hanging around with it. It's a short film, seven minutes long, but I just want to see whether it fully works before I put it out there. But my other um, thing that I want to do as soon as lockdown is over, I um, I sing and play and uh, ha I did a thing at the Brighton Festival Fringe, which was called Professor Hawley's Live 1960s Jukebox, which basically me turning up with my guitar and then the audience um, would uh, shout out a request and I play them <laughs> and, they, and they all sing along. I thought this is never going to work. It's, you know, it's going to be so embarrassing. But actually it was fantastic and everybody, well, I didn't realise everybody has the, the lyrics on their phones. So they read ah. them out. I, I, just, I just know all the songs anyway because it's my era. And um, so the idea is to do that again, probably do it in Sheffield and maybe back at the uh, Brighton Fringe and so on. So yeah, I, as, soon as, as soon as we can. That's my that's my aim. Yeah, well, maybe twenty first of June will be the day for <laughs> Professor <laughs> Hawley's jukebox to reemerge. <laughs> Brilliant! It sounds like a sort of um, impromptu acoustic karaoke scenario. Uh, that's right. That's right. Acoustic karaoke. Yes. Um, um, <laughs> but yeah, everybody joined in. I couldn't believe it. So uh, yeah, I think I'm onto a winner. So we'll see. You know what? I think people. I mean, your timing again, could not be better because people are just desperate for a bit of fun, gathering in a crowd, sweating and hugging and <laughs> doing all the things that we haven't been allowed to do for we, a long time. We, we can't wait. You're absolutely right. Yeah, bring it on. Um, great. Well, Steve, um, is there anything else? I've got your, um, your website up there where people can find loads of stuff about you is there anywhere else people can find you or anything else people um should be aware of uh not really i'm uh yes yeah, steve hawley dot info is the website and all my films are on there um as you said i've done i've been through different sort of phases of um uh, filmmaking with, with different i mean i had a long thing where the, there's one there's one film that uh, i'm not sure so many people saw but it's called not to scale and that's quite an interesting one because i filmed in all the model villages in britain but oh. without any people there so you actually don't know it's a model village it looks like a straight it looks like some sort of uh, neutron bombs gone off then and, and uh, removed all the people in these uh, strange uh, uh, shrunken uh, uh, little uh, perfect pictures of englishness i think maybe englishness is one of my themes actually thinking about it subconsciously definitely a pattern emerging so, uh, yeah if people are interested they can they can go to the website and, and look at all the films for free and uh yeah get in Brilliant. touch if you want i did watch that one actually and i think i mentioned to you it took me back to um when i was a kid we went to holland and went to a little model village there and i found the whole thing interesting but quite disconcerting being bigger than everything around you mm, it is it's just, it's surreal this there's a surreal about it definitely yeah um and we have a question from jean-pierre who asks ah what is the name of the festival it's the clermont ferrand festival is that right it, yes it's clermont ferrand c-l-e-r-m-o-n-t ferrand hyphen ferrand uh short film festival it's actually just happened so um like 10 days ago presumably uh, online yeah, yeah online See, the winner was actually a Slovene film by a woman called oh. Kuta about uh, about a transsexual uh, Slovene person, but um, which is a really big deal. So, um, so if people are interested, um, it's it's a good time now to submit your film for next year. If you go to Film Freeway, uh, if you Google Film Freeway, you can see how to enter all these festivals. Oh, brilliant! Okay, um, so I've put that up in the comments. Um, if anyone comes up with any other questions, they can always send it to us and I can pass them on to Steve for you, um, retrospectively. Um, well, thank you very much, Steve. It was brilliant to speak to you this evening and thank you again for being our patron. Thank you, Claire. I'm delighted to do that. And the very, very best of luck. I know you're doing quite well with the the, fu the funding. So I hope, I wish you the, you know, wish you well for in that. Well done. Thank you very much. Yeah, fingers crossed it keeps keeps going well. Brilliant. Well, I will leave you go and have a lovely evening and um, hopefully we'll speak soon.
Thanks very Take much. Care. Good luck. Bye bye. Okay, so that was Steve Hawley. I've put um, the name of the festival in the comments there for anyone who's interested. Um, and the film that he mentioned just there, Not to Scale, is there as well. You should definitely go and check that out. And you can see his website there, stevehawley.info. That's a brand spanking new uh, website, beautifully created and has a lot of brilliant um brilliant stuff on there that you can see um, a combination of some written work as well as some short films as well that you can watch so do go and check those out um, so we are now going to bring on our next guest who is Giulio Romano um, just before I bring him on um, a reminder that we are crowdfunding for Mr Wong's Lullaby short film that we are making in Sheffield hopefully <laughs> all things going according to plan We'll be filming in April. Um, we're just about halfway through our crowdfunder now and it's been going really well. People have been extremely generous. Um, this week until tomorrow, we're running a special um, uh, special deal, not deal, raffle. Um, so anyone who's donated more than £20 this week will be entered into a raffle to win a Mr Wong's Lullaby limited edition beautiful mug things don't get more exciting than that these days um right so uh without further ado i will introduce our musical guest and this is giulio romano uh giulio is an italian guitarist who made the move to london in 2011 after studying at the again excuse my pronunciation uh gilfredo cattolica music school in civitanova in italy <laughs> and Giulio will help me out with that in a bit. He quickly gained work as a session player, concertist and composer, collaborating with top musicians from all over the world. These included such luminaries as Antonio Forcioni, an awarded guitar player, uh, the world harmonica champion and also a friend of mine, Craig Miller, the Grammy man, Phil Ramacon, the pianist, songwriter and producer and founder of the VG, VJB, Wayne Brown, uh, Lee John Moreno Viglioni uh, and Osmond Wright. And Julia has also had the pleasure of playing for and with high profile singers such as Kate Robbins, Pauline Caitlin, formerly of Brown Sugar Reggae Band and Melanie Stace. He has released his own album, Unexpected Ride, in 2016 and he's also had two albums with his band Gypsy Dynamite. One of these is called Live at Luke Kumbar and the second one was released this, no, last year, 2020, and that is called Cafe Dynamite. So we're delighted to have Julio joining us this evening. I've known Julio for, oh, I think it's about seven years. Um, I keep forgetting how old I am and how long I've been here. So I will invite Julio online. Hey, Julio. Hi. Hey, how is my pronunciation? How bad was it? Be honest. Spot on. Spot on. Oh, you're both too kind and too generous. You need to be less polite. No, no, no. I actually, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. You, you really did a good job in there. <laughs> By the way, I made an effort. Is the audio okay? Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. I can hear you. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, welcome to the streaming world. Okay. Thank you very much. How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm all right. All good. Trying to keep up in this mad world, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, for artists especially. And, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, but you've been busy this year. I mean, you know, it's it's been a difficult year for live, well, live anything, but um, for people in performing arts, it's been difficult. But you've, um, well, you released an album. Yeah, so um, it has been it has been actually. Uh, pretty good in that sense. There's been a lot of writing. There's been a lot of recording. Um, I haven't exactly released a new album yet, but um, it's on its way. Mm -hmm. uh, we just recorded it in uh, November with uh, with a bunch of fantastic musicians and great friends, uh, such as Daniel Antonucci on drums, Nicolotta Keys. Uh, Eduardo Bombaccio on bass, and then there's some great guests that also 
uh, took part, uh, Quentin Collins on trumpet, Basilis Xenopoulos on uh, saxophone, the Ayub sisters, Francesca Confortini. This, this, it, it was quite a big project. And to be honest with you, due to the, uh, you know, lockdown regulations, rest restrictions and things like that, it hasn't been exactly that easy uh, to do, but it's currently being mixed and uh, should be out towards the summer. It hasn't got a, an official release date yet, but working on it. Oh, amazing. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Then on top of that, there's a single that should be out uh, at the beginning of next month, um, which I did with a label uh, called Super Eclectic. And mm -hmm. it's an arrangement of an Italian tune called Mare Mare by Luca Carboni. How do you spell uh, Mare Mare? Mare Mare. Uh, okay. Mare, mare. <laughs> okay. And uh, yeah, it, sh it should be out soon. And it does feature also a, a mix, a remix by Lorenzo Morresi, a DJ and friend of mine and producer as well. So, yeah, I mean, things have been good in that sense. You know. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear you've been busy. Yeah. Um, and are you. Um, teaching or anything julio um you're obviously an accomplished um performer and guitarist in your own right but is teaching something that you like many people have taken up this year <laughs> well uh no <laughs> I, came, <laughs> I came late to the party no actually i i used to do a lot more uh private teaching before covid kicked in and the reason why i stopped uh was actually the fact that um gigging and performing was was going fairly well um and i was busy with it i was busy with writing co-writing and things and um i thought to myself you know probably i'm i'm gonna you know i'm gonna take a break on teaching because it's not exactly what i always thought that i do best but i must admit that I kind of wish I kept it now because, you know, it would have been, well, you know, at least I probably would have learned how to do it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I do, I do a bit of teaching still just a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're more than welcome to, you know, to let me know if you wish to take any guitar lessons. Uh, well, I'm sure after hearing you play, people will be very keen to know how they can um, achieve that standard of guitar playing well we'll see about that hopefully i won't disappoint anyone <laughs> <laughs> i doubt it um and uh julia so um you mentioned also um the interlock album yeah interlock is the one i was telling you earlier about it's oh that's the name of it interlock yeah, that's yeah it's it's all, I mean, it doesn't really have a meaning per se. Uh, it, it, it has to do with the, with the artwork of the, of the album, which obviously will be shown later on in the year. And uh, if, if I had to give it a meaning, it would be the fact that, uh, you know, it's genres and music styles interlocking each cool. other in that sense. So there's a bunch of different things and inspirations and you know hopefully it'd be an interesting listen oh, i'm sure amazing <laughs> based on um i mean i know none of us have any definite idea but based on the recent government announcements here in the uk do you have any ideas when you might be playing live again or is that still up in the air for you well, unfortunately, it's still up in the air, but uh, after tonight, after your kind invitation, which I thank you for, by the way, no um, I might be learning how to do a bit of streaming. So why not? If if this goes well, you know, I might <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I consider actually get on that bandwagon. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, playing live, you know, from my house, you know, why not? I mean, like, it seems like it's the only way forward these days and to be honest with you i miss i miss playing i mean jokes aside i really do miss playing live so much as i bet all my friends and colleagues are as well um mm -hmm. so you know yeah i mean i i wish i knew when we would be back you know but it's hard to tell right now and yeah. that, i know that there all there are also been shows that uh, there are shows that have been postponed due to this mm -hmm. so as soon as I will know a little bit more about it, you know, I'll, uh, I'll post. And let awesome. Know. 
Um, I know there's a couple of venues, well, three venues I know of that you played at regularly in London, certainly. And um, the ones I know of are Le Cacum Bar, which is a beautiful place in Battersea. If anyone's ever in London or anyone lives in London, um, that's a place you should definitely go and check out. And also, um, I think the Toulouse Lautrec, which is another great live music venue. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's Toulouse Lautrec, uh, Zedel, another one which mm -hmm. is people know it as Crazy Cox. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's um, what is Green Node? There, there, there are quite a few places. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's funny talking about it. Feels like ages ago. It feels like ever. <laughs> yeah, ancient like, history. Uh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. But no, I mean, there are quite a few um so yeah if you actually if you visit my website you i mean there, sh there should still be a vintage list of gigs there where you can check these venues um, and hopefully i'll be back there soon Sorry about that, guys. I disappeared. I'm back. But without further ado, that happened quite conveniently. I was about to say, <laughs> let's hand, hand the screen over to Julio. <laughs> no panic, right? No, no panic. No the panic. Audience. The joys of live streaming. <laughs> uh, so I, I will now hand you over to Julio, um, who will serenade you for a few minutes. You're going to play two songs. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Brilliant. Okay. Just, uh, yeah. Just going to play a couple of originals. Um, uh, actually, one of which is um, it's going to be in the next album, upcoming album, which I was telling, uh, was telling you about earlier. And another tune which was recorded in my previous album, Unexpected Ride. Uh, and it's called Music for a Pop. And the first one is called Encuentra el Sol. And they're both like, uh, I shall say, solo guitar tunes uh but they've been arranged so these are unique versions of them because they're live and you know these these are uh as they were originally written ah oh, amazing well we are delighted to have you playing tonight julio uh i'll i'll pop off screen and i'll come back after you've played your two no tunes Ho hopefully so. you'll be able to hear something I'm sure we will. Okay, everyone, enjoy. Okay. So that Thanks. sounds good to me. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I can hear you. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you so much, Julio. Um, that was absolutely gorgeous, and it kind of gave me a sense of um, a sense of summer, which I think we all need at the moment to get just that feeling that spring is in the air and there's something on the horizon, other than um, other than lockdown. <laughs> Absolutely. Whereabouts are you from in Italy, Giulio? I was born in uh, Civitanova Market, born and raised in a place called Civitanova Market, which is um, central Italy on the east coast. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, that's uh, that's my hometown. Then I, uh, like you said earlier, I, I, earlier I moved to London in uh, 2011. It's going to be 10 years uh, in uh, in a few months. Oh wow, you're just I think a year after me. <laughs> Where does the time go? Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I bet you're missing Italy at the moment. Have you managed to get back this year? Um I have managed, yeah, I have managed uh last summer to, to go back. Yeah. And then I, you know, due to further restrictions and, and things, I, I decided to stay. And to be honest, I, I mean I I have the feeling that wherever you go in the world right now, I mean, most places are are tricky to go anyway, and you know, we we better not yeah. move, you know, unless we really need to, I suppose. So that's very good advice. You should do government um, <laughs> questions for the public. Yeah, I know. Better I, not that, to move. That's really boring, isn't it? But yeah. I it know. Seems like that's the advice. So you know, for now. For now, we'll see. Well, thank you so much. Um, like I said, your website is scrolling along the bottom of the screen. So if anyone wants to find out a bit more about Julio and you can also hear his music there and follow him on YouTube and subscribe to his channel. He's got some beautiful stuff up there as well, um, which might remind you of what it's like to be in a live venue hearing live music. So please do go and check that out um, and keep an eye out for his forthcoming releases. Um, He's a brilliant artist and musician. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Claire, for having me. Thanks. That's thank a pleasure. Much. Stay safe and stay well and stay sane. <laughs> Take care. See you. Take care. Bye bye. Okay, everyone. Well, that was uh, Giulio Romano. My Italian is not very good. It's uh, actually pretty bad, um, but his music is beautiful. So please do check it out. And when we can go back out again, please do go and support live music. Well, art and live performance generally. Um, right. So we've just come to the end of our session for this evening. Thank you all very much for joining us again. Uh, it was lovely to be joined by Steve and Julio. Um, I will put up again, because I'm really bad at this, our own uh, Mr. Wong's Lullaby. So we're up on Indiegogo. I think that's in the comments, the um, the Indiegogo link. And we're also on Instagram and on Twitter at Mr. Wong's Lullaby. So you can follow us there to find out about what we're up to. We have another live event next week, and that will be with a brilliant Sheffield musician called Emma Savile. So she'll be joining us. And we will also be joined by Jenny Hockey, who is an anthropologist, who is a professor, and who is a poet. So I will be in very um, well-educated company next week. No doubt I'll make a show of myself again, but that's fine. We're all friends here. Um, so thank you again, everyone. Um, like I said, we're doing our 
special perk this year so or this week rather anyone who makes a donation of 20 pounds and above will be entered into a draw to win a special rookie films limited edition mug and i will finish on a very profound note that i read this evening um and i think it's something that we can all take with us going forward and this is from uh live from snack time from graham aged eight May there always be pizza in your heart and poppies in your soul. Namaste, everyone. Take care.